I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Maserati Rick in Detroit Convertible bird in Miami Graduated summa cum laude Strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central Larry Davis from Close Range A well-established youthful drug ring Also terrorized the area in the 80s the group was called the Lexington Terrace Boys, and their violent impact was felt even at the neighboring Po homes. This group killed two victims at a row house basement, and later shot dead a witness to those crimes while he was walking down the street. This the total number of drug busts has more than doubled over the past decade, but the number of blacks busted has skyrocketed, up by 270%. NBC's Robin Lloyd reports from the front lines in Baltimore, Maryland. Even during the day on a street corner in southwestern Baltimore, undercover cops are making arrests. The drug war is exploding here. In the last year, sensational drug busts have become commonplace. Cocaine gangs, heroin smuggling rings, crack dealers, they're all here. Police are now arresting more than 35 people a day on drug charges. But almost all of these arrests are taking place in black neighborhoods. Pardon, you're under arrest. Consider this. Of those busted on drug charges in Baltimore, 85% are black, even though most estimates are that nearly half of all drug users in the city are white. The arrest figures for teenagers are even more startling. More than 90% are blacks. Many of the city's black leaders are asking, what's going on here? Racism is certainly involved. No question about that. Circuit Court Judge Kenneth Johnson says he believes the war on drugs is racially biased, and he's called a grand jury to investigate why so many blacks have been picked up. It's not my position that we should not be arresting these people. We should, but we should also arrest and convict the wholesaler, the supplier, and we're not doing that, and these people are basically white. But look at this, a drug deal on a street corner in broad daylight. Police say in many black communities, crack cocaine is sharply on the rise, and the deals are highly visible. Blacks stand on the street corners, and they're exposed, and so therefore, as they're making these transactions, they are easy targets for the police. Easy targets, these policemen say, that make impressive arrest records. Community leaders are outraged. We have policies that have sucked money out of housing programs and out of education programs and health care programs while we have put money into this so-called war on drugs. It's no more than a war on young blacks. Not only here in Baltimore, but in other cities, more and more questions are now being raised about the drug war. All across the country, the number of blacks being arrested for drugs is growing dramatically. In cities as different as Birmingham, Alabama, Jacksonville, Florida, Columbus, Ohio, the figures show that more than 85% of the drug arrests are blacks. Federal drug officials say the reason for the high number of arrests is that people in the black neighborhoods want more action. There is a demand by people who live there that they want their neighborhood back, and I think they deserve it. You hear the gunshots every night. People like Bill Gordon, a bank teller, want more protection, but are afraid more police won't solve the problem. Even the mayor of Baltimore is concerned about the growing number of black arrests and the federal government's get-tough policy. Am I saying that that's winning the war on drugs? It's not. It is not winning the war on drugs. It is temporarily keeping uh, some safety in the, uh, in the cities, but at an enormous cost in the future. A cost that is tearing apart black neighborhoods and cities all over the country, where the casualties of the drug war are more visible every day. Robin Lloyd, NBC News, Baltimore. Yo, yo. We back. It's your boy, Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Maryland with it. Body more. Out west. Lexington Terrace, to be exact. All my niggas from B-more, y'all niggas get in the comment box. Y'all know we live around the corner. We always out this bitch tap in now 
Today, we're going to be covering an organization by the name of the Lexington Terrace Boys. And pretty much the timeline from the Lexington Terrace Boys is going to be like the mid-90s up until right around 2002. And when you hear Lexington Terrace, most people probably think, First, I guess I'm the wire. I'm going to say in any shit, Baltimore, niggas think of the wire. But you might think of Nathan Bodie Barksdale, or you might think of Warren Black Borley. And Lexington Terrace is going to be pretty much the same place where some of those guys earned their name. Now, as far as the Lexington Terrace boys, the main people that we're going to be talking about is going to be a guy by the name of Keon Moses and another gentleman by the name of Michael Taylor. But you also might name that you also might hear the name Aaron Foster because he pops in with sprinkles in on the story. But now in the case surrounding the Lexington Terrace boys concerns a drug conspiracy that took place within approximately a six square block neighborhood in West Baltimore known as Lexington Terrace. According to the government's evidence produced at trial between 1999 and 2002, rampant drug dealing took place in Lexington Terrace and numerous acts of violence were performed in the neighborhood to protect that drug dealing activity. Now, I'm going to just tell y'all that the drugs been going down in Lexington Terrace. That's why you have Bodie Barksdale and you have Black Borley. But the Lexington Terrace neighborhood was an open-air drug market with substantial quantities of crack were sold on a daily basis during the charge time frame. All the dealers in the neighborhood had grown up in Lexington Terrace or worked with the person who had grown up there. Some dealers belonged to a particular drug distribution gang within the neighborhood, while others did not. Moreover, dealers often bore tattoos which recognized their relationship to the neighborhood. In some respects, Lexington Terrace dealers were independent of other dealers. For example, different dealers offered had often had different sources of supplies. Some dealers sold their drugs in a distinctive color top vial, which allowed users to associate the color top vial with the quality of the product. Moreover, dealers competed with other dealers for business. Thus, when a vehicle approached with somebody looking to buy drugs, multiple dealers, perhaps from multiple drug gangs approach the vehicle trying to get that sale now and some other respects the Lexington Terrace drug dealers worked in cohorts with each other they shared stash houses and firearms they respected a user's selection of a particular dealer which allowed numerous dealers to operate in the area even dealers not associated with the gang dealers decisions to leave a drug gang generally was respected and the departing dealer enjoyed the freedom to deal drugs on their own. Neighborhood dealers also made change for each other on occasion. Now, for mutual aid and protection, Lexington Terrace dealers alerted each other of the presence of law enforcement and authorities and jointly controlled the area. Throughout the use of intimidation and violence, and to the exclusion of others, dealers who experienced legal troubles often referred to often received financial assistance from other neighborhood dealers. For example, a dealer's legal expenses might be paid by another dealer or a dealer incarcerated might receive some money to spend in prison. Dealers returning to the neighborhood from a prison stint will often receive drugs on the front to sell from other dealers, which allowed the newly released dealer to reestablish himself financially in the community. Now, that peaceful coexistence between the neighborhood dealers work to benefit both the users and the neighborhood dealers according to authorities users enjoyed the regular ability of drugs in the neighborhood while the dealers were able to thrive financially with steady businesses with little violence amongst themselves now it's going to be within this time frame and in that environment that the government claims that moses taylor and foster sold substantial quantities of crack Foster was from the Lexington Terrace neighborhood and had le Terrace Life tattooed on his right forearm. Several witnesses testified that they had purchased crack from Foster. Moreover, Aaron Butler, who was a neighborhood dealer, testified in 1999.
Foster was selling great top vials of crack while using Monique Andrews' house as a stash house. Butler further testified that in 2000, he and Foster were selling crack together. Another witness testified that Foster was at times in charge of supervising his gang's drug activity. Now, Foster was incarcerated on July, in July of 2000, and upon his release in October of 2001, he returned to Lexington Terrace and began dealing crack again. Now, Moses also grew up in Lexington Terrace. Butler testified that in 1999, Moses was selling crack with a guy by the name of Brandon Allison, using, just like Foster, Monique Andrews' house as a stash house. Moses was arrested at that house on June 15, 1999, with the keys to the house in his pocket. Now, following a period of incarceration, Moses was released in, in August of 2001 and immediately began selling purple top vials of crack with Taylor. Moses was stopped in his vehicle by law enforcement officers in September of 2001 and had 300 empty purple top vials in his car. Now, a gentleman by the name of Greg Spain was fronting narcotics to Moses in August and September of 2001 because Moses had just been released from prison. So he was trying to help him get back on his feet pretty much. Now, although he was eventually incar incarcerated on state charges for committing a double murder, Moses remained a participating member of the drug conspiracy. And from jail, he wrote a letter to Taylor instructing Taylor to kill one of the witnesses that was getting ready to testify against him. Now, Taylor also grew up in Lexington Terrace and had Lexington Terrace tattoos. In mid to late 2001, Taylor was selling purple top vials of crack with Moses. Taylor also gave Moses, also gave Moses money while he was on a run for the double homicide. At various times, Taylor sold crack and shared stash houses with other Lexington Terrace dealers. Now, on Janu in January of 2002, after he turned 18 years old, Taylor's participation in the drug conspiracy began to escalate. He began dealing drugs with Brandon Allison. That same month, Taylor was arrested in two raids at a stash house owned by a female by the name of Pamela Mack that was shared with other Lexington drug dealers. Now, in one of the raids, Taylor's fingerprints was found on a gun that was recovered at the residence. Taylor would later admit to the authorities that he was a drug dealer in the Lexington Terrace neighborhoods. Now, in addition to that extensive drug dealing activity that the authorities had on them and the witnesses, they, they would go on to focus on related crimes of violence. And they're gonna say that the first one of those crimes occurred in September um, on the 23rd in 2001 at 303 North Calhoun Street in Baltimore. Now in the basement, that, that crime was gonna occur in the basement of a row house that was owned by a guy named Charles Brockington grandmother now on that day Moses and Taylor they were accompanied by a guy by the name of Marcus Baskerville now they, they allegedly killed Gregory Spann who had supplied Moses in September and August of 2001 and another gentleman by the name of Ronald Harris and attempted to kill Charles Brockington now Spain Harris and Brockington were a group of drug dealers in a neighborhood that was close to Lexington Terrace. Moses had been supplied by Spain earlier, as I mentioned, when he was released from prison in 2001, but Moses and Spain eventually had a falling out. So Moses decided to steal Spain's stash with the help of Taylor and Baskerville. Now Moses, Taylor and Baskerville donned masks, bandanas, and caps, and they went to Brockington's house on the day in question where they found Brockington in bed. Brockington lived in the basement of his grandmother's house and the front door was usually unlocked. But, uh, and the reason it was unlocked because Spain Harris, a guy by the name of Robert Snoop McManus and another gentleman by the name of Samuel Wilder usually came around every day. They woke Brockington up so they can play video games, smoke, hang out. And on the day of the murders, Brockington heard what he believed to be his friends entering the house and coming downstairs. 
he was awoke to three armed masked men surrounding his bed. The assailants demanded drugs, money, and firearms, and they kept asking for Spain. Now, Spain would eventually arrive as expected, but he couldn't get in and started shouting at the front door. Moses and Taylor took Brockington upstairs to open the door. Brockington tried to warn Spain with his eyes and give him hints that it was an issue, but Moses grabbed Spain and pulled him inside. Now, all four of them went back downstairs, leaving the front door unlocked. Harris would then show up to the house and walked right into the robbery in the basement. Now, at that time, Moses took Brockington outside to a waiting vehicle that they had and drove him to a location where the trio said that drugs were supposedly located. Now, Taylor and Baskerville were left guarding Harris in Spain. When Moses learned that there were no drugs at the location that they sent them to, Moses would end up bringing Brockington back to the house on North Calhoun Street. Now, Moses yelling for someone to open the door. Taylor, leaving Baskerville with Spain and Harris, went to answer the door. Now, Brockington, who is the lone surviving victim, recalled Taylor opening the door and then hearing the sound of a single shot coming from the basement just as they got inside the front door. Now, Taylor had his firearm in one hand and he was pulling Brockington downstairs to the basement by his shirt with the other hand. Brockington watched as Harris ran to one end of the basement with Baskerville in pursuit and Spain ran to the other end of the basement with Moses and Taylor in pursuit. Brockington was being pulled along by Taylor the whole time. Now Moses and Spain shot at least seven times, which resulted in the, I mean, Moses shot Spain seven times, which resulted in Spain's death. Now Taylor shot Brockington in the neck, shoulder, and tried to shoot him in the face as he fell. Brockington remained conscious and he watched from the ground as Moses and Taylor ran to the other end of the basement in the direction of Harris and Baskerville. Now, more shots was fired, resulting in Harris's death. Now, as the assailants left the basement, Brockington called for Span, which led Taylor to come back, and he stood over Brockington and shot him again in the chest. Now, um, being mortally wounded, Brockington slipped in and out of consciousness, and after a while, he was able to man he pretty much managed to get outside of the house and he would be found face down on the sidewalk bleeding profusely from eight gunshot wounds by his father now by his father and the other two gentlemen that they said they were associated with uh snoop mcmanus and wilder now the three of them to the three of them and to the officers on the scene brockington stated that keon shot me so that's going to be um, pretty much one of the, the that's going to be the kick. That's going to be the kicker. That's going to be one of the main things that brought them down. But before that, on February 22nd of 2002 in the 1800 block of Mount Street in Baltimore, Michael Taylor would end up killing Snoop McManus, um, who was the one witness that was relevant to the homicides that happened on September 23rd, 2001. Now, it, like I just said, McManus had seen Moses, uh, well, I didn't state this, he had seen Moses before looking for Spain, and he also was there when Brockington had told the authorities and his dad that Keon shot me. Um, now, at about 5 p.m. that day, a minister who happened to be driving through the block saw a lone gunman wearing a hoodie chasing McManus and shooting at him. McManus fell and the gunman stood over him and shot him again before running away, leaving McManus dead. Uh, and in, 2000, in May of 2002, law enforcement officers were investigating the murder of a gentleman by the name of Vance Beasley. In connection with that investigation, the officers executed a search warrant at Taylor's house and recovered a letter that was written to Taylor in early February 2002 by Moses, who was in jail pending the state trial for the murders of Span and Harris. Now, the letters contained instructions to Taylor to kill McManus. In fact, Moses had identified McManus as the one who could hurt Moses without Taylor's intervention. And the letter stated verbatim, his statements can hurt me, dog. 
I don't got to say it. You know what I mean. Now, Butler testified that prior to McManus' murder, Taylor and Butler had seen McManus on the street on two different occasions, and Taylor discussed how he was going to kill McManus. On the first occasion, there was too many witnesses around, and on the second occasion, Taylor didn't have his gun with him. So, a subsequent recorded conversation, in a subsequent recorded conversation, Butler confronted Taylor with McManus's murder after the fact, and Taylor didn't deny committing the murder. So, on August 15, 2002, this is all going down because they're trying to wipe the slate of everybody. So, that's three out of four down. Now, on August 15, 2002, in the 300 block of North Stricker Street in Baltimore, Taylor and Foster attempted to kidnap Wilder, who was the lone person besides besides the gentleman's dad. So pretty much all four drug dealers, they pretty much went to go wipe them wipe them out. Um, now he was he was the other gentleman that was with Brockington's father when when they found him after being shot. Now that attempt didn't work and the reason it didn't work is because uh, he was strapped pretty much so Taylor and Forstner along with Moses's girlfriend were present at Moses's court hearing and Forstner and Taylor had driven to court with Moses's girlfriend and on the way home they detoured through Stricker and Saratoga streets looking for somebody now, after Taylor and Foster dropped off the girlfriend, they went back to the 300 block of North Stricker Street. And while they were there, Taylor and Foster jumped out the vehicle. Taylor grabbed Wilder from behind, and it was a struggle. Wilder would end up pulling out that gun and shot Foster. Foster was taken to the hospital. Wilder and the gun were recovered, and Wilder was charged with attempted murder. Now, Foster's statement to the police as a victim of the shooting he, he and Taylor were just trying to bring Wilder to court. Now, in a recorded conversation, Taylor told Butler that they wanted to sit with Wilder at Moses' trial to try to intimidate Brockington during the testimony. So that was kind of just really the kicker. But they also had an incident on June 11, 2020, where a dealer that was associated with the gang would end up killing a crack addict that tried to get crack and drive off with it so that was just one we we just highlighted i want to say four of the nine murders that they was accused of so this was a definitely a violent organization in baltimore and at their trial and the, this is going to be what stood out to me at their trial they called the detective that pretty much provided a lot of the information and a lot of the names for the wire to testify about their environment growing up and just the Lex the Lexington Terrace projects, uh, how how it was just it was just a no way out situation where drugs was everywhere and pretty much a lot of people would say that's what saved them from receiving a death penalty and just getting life. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, it's your boy Popalot, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. We gonna be back with some more real trill spill shit. Y'all hit me up on the, under the pictures. Y'all get at me in a direct message. Y'all get at me in the comment box. Y'all hit my line. Y'all pull up on me. Y'all already know what it is, man. It's the mob, 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 ties.